Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Wayne Walker. Tonight we begin our show with a story about neotropical migrants, the animals most of us call songbirds. Now, how many times have you walked through the forests of Idaho and really listened? Well, the concert begins at dawn, and the best seat is on the top of the mountain. better than being able to walk through the woods and being able to identify everything you hear around you. Uh, the slightest noise or chuck or whistle or warble or chip, you know, even the smallest of, so of sounds, just being able to know what that is. Because you can, very rarely do you actually see much of this stuff. You have to sit pretty quietly and uh, they do remain quite elusive and some birds will sing from the very topmost of a tree that could be 30, 40, 50, 60 feet high, and there's no way you'll actually ever see the bird. But it's just a great feeling to, be, to know everything that you're hearing around you. The western tanager across the drainage, still in the stand, um, and that's a bird that uh, is a neotropical migrant, and uh, you can identify that song. Um, it's a very quick uh, robin-like song, but very raspy. Sounds like a robin with a sore throat. Um, that's singing fairly frequently over there, kind of a zip, 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 and it'll stop, and then it'll zip, 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 that kind of speed. Quite buzzy. Rex's childhood hobby developed into a career as a wildlife research biologist. This morning, he's conducting a point count. It's a standard scientific technique used by research biologists to survey songbird populations. Understandably, there's a problem trying to count something you can't see. So instead, biologists rely on their sense of hearing. It works like this. A series of points are chosen in a study area. About an hour after sunrise, the researcher stands at one of these designated locations and simply records every bird he hears within 50 meters during a 10-minute period. This must be done at intervals throughout the nesting season and for several years in a row in order to develop an accurate record. The way we do this, we simply keep track of where we are, uh, the time in the morning, um, just some wet notes about the weather. This is a particu which particular um, point count we're at. We have four of them in each stand. This is the first one. Beautiful song. Neotropical migrants are those remarkable songbirds that make the long journey south each fall to wintering grounds in Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. In the spring, they return here to areas like this in the United States and Canada to breed and raise their young. Recently, there's been some concern that okay. populations of these neotropical right. migrant the species may be right. declining. But, as you can imagine, migrating birds by their very nature are difficult to study since they don't stay in one habitat all year round. The objective of this research project is to determine what these various bird species require in terms of breeding habitat to be successful at nesting and raising healthy young. It's a cooperative effort funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Boise Cascade Corporation, the Forest Service, and Idaho Department of Fish and Game. But we follow, we follow the birds to the nest because they'll either bring food to the young or to the female incubating, or they'll be making the nest if they have nest material. Simply surveying the birds doesn't tell biologists whether the bird has been successful at nesting. So, in addition to point counts, the scientists are conducting nest searches. Best time to nest search is right now, early in the morning. You know, obviously the young have, haven't been fed all night. They're hungry. The, the, this is the most active time as far as birds bringing food into them. The biologists have spotted an Oregon dark-eyed junco in the tree. It's a male, and he's carrying food for the nestlings. This species is a resident bird. It doesn't migrate, but rather spends the whole year here in Idaho. A search of the ground nearby uncovers a small nest hidden beneath a log. Three very young nestlings in here, probably just a couple days old. 
And what we'll do from now on is monitor this nest every three or four days to make sure it's still active and hopefully see this, uh, this brood fledge. The study area ranges from Idaho City to New Meadows and includes over 100 plots of varying habitats. On each of these plots, the scientists conduct point counts and nest searches. They also take careful measurements of the vegetation, recording all kinds of data, such as the size and species of the trees, how open the overhead canopy is, the ground vegetation, and so forth. Therefore, we can ultimately begin to get some understanding of which vegetational characters are important, not only for a bird's presence or absence, but also its reproductive success. Studies have shown that snags, large dead trees, are extremely important to a number of bird species. Cavity nesters like woodpeckers and mountain bluebirds build their nest in snags, and other species like the dusky flycatcher use snags as a place to forage for food. I think everybody agrees, well I know everybody agrees snags need to be left. The big debate is how many to leave. How many snags of a particular size does a particular bird species require? Um, and that is something that we can hopefully eventually address, but at this point um, with just one or two years worth of data, we can't really say anything uh, too conclusively. I can't tell which way it's twisted. This is a mist net. It's a delicate netting strung between two poles designed to capture birds for banding. Each leg band is color-coded so scientists can determine if it is the same bird returning to nest in a particular tree each year. If the young are also banded, researchers can see how far they disperse from the nest when they fledge. Once the net is set up, it doesn't take long for a capture. An Oregon dark-eyed junco. This is the male of that nest, just across the, the drainage here, f uh, of which you have some filmed earlier. And uh, we have the female already banded, so now we'll have both male and female banded. The small junco is taken away from the capture area to be banded. It's mid-morning, and the summer day has warmed up. The window of opportunity is closing for the biologists. Nestling have all been fed, and the choir has subsided for the day. But tomorrow, nature's resounding chorus will once again greet the dawn. And somewhere in the woods, Rex will be listening. This is a real lake trout here. <laughs> That's what people are after right there. Some of the best trophy fishing in our state is at Payette Lake near McCall. Big lake trout, also known as Mackinac, can grow up to 30 pounds in the chilly waters of this beautiful mountain lake. It's the perfect spot to spend a summer weekend. Yeah, it's a great place to come fishing and expect to catch a nice lake trout. Paul Jansen goes out fishing for lake trout every chance he gets, but today it's a work day. So instead of fishing for the big ones, He's listening for them. And we've got a fish just over this direction right now. I don't know what number it is yet. It's too far away, but. 10 of these big lake trout are swimming around Payette Lake sporting sonar tags. The tags look like this. Well, what I do is just put this ear in here and slowly turn it 360 degrees till I hear a beep. And then I get a direction on it and I'll take the boat over there so I can get, till I can get right over top of the fish. Every two to three weeks, all year round, Paul comes out here and systematically searches the lake until he locates all 10 of his tagged fish. This way, he can keep track of how much of the lake they cover, and hopefully this fall, he'll be able to discover their spawning grounds. Gathering good information is the key to sound management of a great resource. Here we have a good number of big fish and we want to maintain that. It's a true trophy fishery. So how about a look at those big fish? There's six in here oh, good. that we already netted this morning. Great. Just waiting to have a tag put in them. 
Another part of Paul's study includes marking the fish with bright red spaghetti tags or reward tags. This is a narrow cord that has an identification number written on it. When anglers catch a fish with one of these tags, they're asked to send it in to the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. In return, they receive a $10 reward. They're still there, they all look happy. Lake trout are a cold, clean water fish. They require temperatures in the 40 degree range year round. This deep mountain lake seems to provide everything these fish need, including a healthy kokanee population to prey upon. That one's 21 pounds. Okay, we're just weighing and measuring all these fish, and then we're putting a reward tag in. We're gonna tag these fish so we can tell how many of these fish get caught each year. And when we get tags back, it helps us a whole bunch to evaluate what's going on with population so that so that we don't lose these kind of fish in this lake. Occasionally, Paul will remove some scales from the side of a fish. Back in the office, he lays them on a slide and then magnifies it on a microfish reader. The scales look like a large fingerprint. Each dark ring represents a year of growth. In this manner, Paul can correlate age to the fish's measurements and determine its growth rate. A 24-inch fish from what we've aged is approximately seven, six to eight years old. And some preliminary work we've done, looks like they grow about an inch a year after that. So if you get a 34 inch fish, that fish is 18 to 20 years old. That's what people are after right there. She weighs in at 10,250 grams, that's about 11, 22 25, pounds, 10, 25, and measures 908 millimeters, which translates into over 36 inches. So we can conclude from Paul's research that this big lake trout has been swimming around Payette Lake for at least 20 years. Okay, she's ready to go back. These aren't the first lake trout to receive the bright spaghetti tag. A similar study was conducted at Payette Lake in 1988 to determine what percentage of the population was being harvested each year. After we compared the population structure from 1988 to 94 and 95, we saw a pretty significant shift in the size structure of the population. A lot fewer large fish and more smaller fish. Paul speculates that the few fish being harvested are the bigger fish, and this is triggering the population change. So what we want to do is to have a stricter regulation. Right now they can catch six fish, any size fish. What we'd like to do is go with one fish, and it would have to be over 36 inches to keep, which is about a 20-pound fish, real nice fish. Real surveys of lake trout fishermen show that 90% of anglers are strongly in favor of this protection for the big fish. So how does one go about catching one of these hogs? Paul's brother Alan and nephew Joel are visiting from northern Wisconsin. And as we start out, we're already hearing the classic line from our host, you should have been here yesterday. Uh, yesterday we um, caught how many? Five? They what would that, that feel like catching them? Oh, they were fun. Fight? Some were up, six, was, six pounds was the smallest, and a little over 10 was the largest. Alan and Joel troll for the fish using a simple three-way swivel, dragging their lure along the bottom. They released yesterday's catch, so those fish are out there somewhere, waiting to be caught again. Yeah, that kind of preserves your uh, resource here. Uh, you don't really need that much uh, food in the freezer anyway. Uh, it's a lot more fun just to, if you really need fish, take one home. Uh, there's a lot of meat on them, so uh, one will last you a long time. Let the others go and come back again for another day of good fishing. Um, depending on the study, it's closer to 50-50 or even 30% um, in the field and 70% in the office. In our first two stories tonight, we showed you the glamorous side of a biologist's job, surveying songbirds at sunrise or marking big lake trout for research. Of course, this is a part that makes for good television. 
but the truth is, it's not a very accurate portrayal of the day-to-day -day life of a wildlife biologist. I think public perception is my job's probably 95% field work, fun stuff, and 5%, you know, in the office kind of doing reports, or probably in reality, um, depending on the study, it's closer to 50-50 or even 30% um, in the field and 70% in the office. Jim Unsworth is a principal wildlife research biologist for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. His job is to conduct the research necessary to provide Idaho sportsmen with the best possible hunting opportunity in southwest Idaho. Over the years, we featured the more exciting aspects of Jim's job, like this story in the winter of 1993 when Jim was capturing and radio collaring mule deer. What we didn't show you were the countless hours spent in front of a computer, entering all the information gathered on that study, setting up the statistical programs to interpret the data and analyzing the results. And it doesn't end there. Well, you know, publication is the end result to your research. So you've, you analyze your data, you write up the results and conclusions to your study, then you submit it to a professional journal. If the editor decides the study has merit, it's distributed to three or four other professional biologists for what's called a peer review. Their comments are sent with the manuscript back to Jim for a rewrite. After incorporating the suggestions from his peers, Jim resubmits the manuscript, and it eventually ends up in a publication like this, an essential reference source for any biologist making wildlife management decisions. Jim's job also requires him to read or review other researchers' publications, design credible studies to answer management questions, and supervise graduate students. Normally they're a part of a bigger project, like on my deer study. I have three graduate students working for me right now. They pick a small part of the research and direct their efforts towards it. <clears throat> they help us with the bigger picture of the research, and then they get a degree out of the out of the program. A master's degree has become virtually a requirement to be considered for a job like Jim's. Seventy nine percent of the researchers and managers at the Idaho Department of Fish and Game have master's degrees and Jim Unsworth is among the 15 percent who have gone on to earn a PhD. The Fish and Game Department does indeed have an incredible academic level of its workforce. We attract people to Idaho not because of salary or those kinds of things, but we attract them here because of where Idaho is and what we have in the way of backcountry, what we have in the way of a resource to be managed. Hi, I'm from the Fish and Game Department. I'd like to ask a few questions today. Um, how long have you guys been out fishing today? Dick Scully's years of experience as a fisheries research biologist, along with the training he acquired earning a Ph.D., provides a strong background for his present position as the fisheries manager for southeast Idaho. Did you catch any cutthroat today? Nope. Hey. Okay. Well, there's a few hiding out out there. Today, he's out surveying anglers on Blackfoot Reservoir. It's about 19 and a half, and I think that's... That's the important part of management is being able to blend the biology yeah. with uh, working with people. So you gonna have a barbecue tonight? Hunters and yeah, anglers are an essential part of management decisions. On the, the next one uh, is, is a subject that I know a lot of people have thought about and that's the slot limit, the eight inch to 16 inch cutthroat slot limit that we've had since 1990 throughout Southeast Idaho. The evening before, we caught up with Dick in the town of Montpelier, conducting a public input meeting for the 1996-97 fishing regulations. Are, are you making a suggestion for, for a two fish, but a minimum size on the cutthroat? It's, it's a two-way communication, and they understand what you're saying, and you, and you can listen and understand what they're saying and, and appreciate the kind of, a, kind of knowledge they have, which is usually uh, a lot of experiences fishing and hunting, and that it, it generates some knowledge that, that, that sometimes is different than, than, than an individual biologist might have. And, okay. And, and what, what length limit would you recommend, suggest? Each participant is asked okay. to complete this four-page survey, on, on 
asking specific questions about regulations. Early the next morning, Dick's back at the office, sorting through the surveys and tallying the results. The desk work is not glamorous, and it may not make good television, but it's a very real part of the job for the managers and researchers whose goal it is to make sound, critical decisions that will perpetuate our wildlife resource. If you like the resource and you like uh, making the resource better uh, for the public, there's that kind of satisfaction. Protecting the resource on one hand and on the other hand um, produce a lot of happy anglers. That's, that's the other goal. Thanks for joining us. We'll close our show tonight by greeting the Don once more with nature's early morning choir. <laughs>